And looks like I was right again. Oil production from the U.S. Gulf of Mexico region has exceeded 2 million barrels per day and has exceeded such before the end of the year, as I had expected and called it to. That was one of several predictions or callouts for this year done back in this video that's appearing up in the corner. It will also appear as one of the links at the end of this video on the end screen, in case any of you are doubting that I actually did say anything was going to happen before it ended up happening. But U.S. Gulf of Mexico oil production has now exceeded 2 million barrels per day, up to 2.006. So hello and welcome back everybody to another energy and resource update episode. We do one of these every week, usually comes out on Saturday, if I'm lazy it comes out on Sunday. And we go over everything of relative significance over the course of the week pertaining to energy and natural resources, oil, gas, minerals, mining, everything of actual importance that actually matters and underpins the civilization that you live in, but is essentially ignored by the mainstream media of the modern day. But if you care about energy and resources and mining and things of the sort, please subscribe and stick around here. This is definitely a channel for you. And again, if anyone would like to donate to the channel and help keep both it and really me alive, as I'm losing my job in less than two months now, then my PayPal.me is down in the description below. But irregardless, let's get started with this week's data. U.S. oil production remains the same, holding at 12.6 million barrels per day for a fourth week. Again, I'm expecting it to get up to 12.8 by the end of the year, and the U.S. final peak to come probably between 13.5 and 13.8, maybe 13.9. U.S. oil consumption uh, bumped up this week, up to 21.6 million barrels per day. Individual product numbers within that coming out to gasoline consumption coming up high to 9.78 million barrels per day. Diesel fuel consumption in the U.S. coming up to 4.26 and jet fuel consumption dropping down to 1.83. As mentioned, oil production from the Gulf of Mexico has now exceeded 2 million barrels per day. California's oil production continues its terminal decline from its peak in the 1980s at 1.1 million barrels per day, and now as of this latest data release has fallen all the way down to 439,000 barrels per day. And in terms of actively drilling rigs, the total U.S. count has now fallen all the way down to 822. Nearly a 300 rig drop from a little over a year ago, back during last summer, when the U.S. active drilling rig count was up close to 1,100. Some individual states that have lost the most, Texas, since summer of last year, has fallen all the way down from about 600 to now 416. And Oklahoma, just during this year, and really just during the last several months or so, has lost, has lost over half of its drilling rigs dropping down from around 120 down to only 51 now. U.S. crude oil inventories increased this week up by 5.7 million barrels, while the price of oil fluctuated between $53 and $57 per barrel, starting off towards $57, dropping towards $53 over the course of the week before rebounding at the end. On the natural gas side, U.S. natural gas production remains relatively the same at about 107.5 billion cubic feet per day. U.S. natural gas consumption bumping up this week to 84.3 billion cubic feet per day as heating demand is beginning to rise as uh, the cold is starting to set in for most locations. Heating demand in particular for this data set coming in at 14.1 billion cubic feet per day. Natural gas consumption by natural gas fired power plants staying relatively the same at just over 30 billion cubic feet per day. U.S. natural gas exports on LNG tankers exceeding 7 billion cubic feet per day, hitting 7.1 this week. In consumption by the natural gas pipeline system for its own pumping system fuel coming in at the same as it has the past few weeks, 6.4. U.S. natural gas storage inventories, in terms of trillion cubic feet in storage, are now up to just under 3.7. In comparison to normally this time of year, they're at around 3.64. And last year, which was a very high demand winter year, they were still down at 3.14. And natural gas prices this week were between $2.50 and $2.80 per thousand cubic feet, climbing up over the course of the week before falling and then rebounding upwards again. And we have the monthly oil production data for the group of six nations. Canada's oil production dropped a little bit, 
from 4.4 down to 4.35 million barrels per day. China's oil production still clinging on to their same range as they have for the past year or two, dropping back down from 3.92 down to 3.83 million barrels per day. Mexico stalling their terminal decline for a little bit longer, having another tiny uptick this month from 1.69 up to 1.7 million barrels per day. Norway beginning to climb back up, this month coming in at 1.57 million barrels per day. And Russia came in basically the same, dropping a tiny bit from 10.76 down to 10.75 million barrels per day. And over in metals and all else, gold came back up above 1,500 again. Global gold inventories over the course of the week increased by a decent bit, up from 8.19 to 8.38 million ounces in storage. Global gold production has not peaked yet, but it is likely about to. Global silver production from silver mines has already peaked. It peaked back in 2015 and has declined about 7-9% to since then, while of course demand keeps going only in one direction. Silver inventories this week remained flat in comparison to last week. They stayed right around 315 million ounces in storage, though a far cry down from the pre-silver peak times in the early 2010s when there were nearly 2 billion ounces in storage. And silver prices this week climbed back up over $18 per ounce. Platinum continued climbing up to $950 per ounce, while platinum inventories remained relatively flat, still at 164,000 ounces in storage. Palladium now only just above 52,000 ounces in storage. And over the course of this week, palladium was fluctuating around, up over, then down under, up over again, fluctuating around the $1,800 per ounce mark. And rhodium continues declining after hitting $5,550 an ounce, this week now dropping down to $5,375. The reason for the high platinum group metal prices being many nations, especially China, the largest, increasing their vehicle emission standards as the primary source of consumption for platinum group metals is catalytic converters on the underside of cars, which detoxify your car's exhaust. While the more strict vehicle emission regulations you have, the more thorough the catalytic converting process has to be, which requires more platinum group metals. So thus, platinum group metal demand is rising up really quickly. And global production levels from platinum group metal mines has been relatively flat for about a decade or so. Although, with regards to platinum group metals, when we say globally, you basically just mean South Africa, because uh, the overwhelming majority of most of them uh, are just mined out of the Bushveld complex in South Africa. Along with significantly large percentages of other metals and minerals too. All of which you can learn about in the video that's appearing in the corner up here. You can learn in detail about the South Africa problem. Now over to the base metals. Aluminum inventories continue declining a little bit down from 964,000 to 959,000 tons in storage. Granted, still a far cry down from their all-time height when they were at 6 million tons in storage. Aluminum prices over the course of the week shot up from 1720 up to $1,790 per ton. Nickel inventories continue dropping from 71,000 down to 67,000 tons in storage. As nickel demand continues expanding, both from increasing steel production from rising third world nations, and especially and very quickly now from the production of electric vehicle batteries. But even despite that, the market, in quotation marks, apparently doesn't care. And nickel prices are still staying a bit under $17,000 a ton and not really moving. Lead inventories actually began increasing again for the first time in a while going up by about 1,000 from 69 up to 70,000 tons in storage. Leading lead prices to drop a little bit. They were at around 2,200. They went up over 2,200, but then they came back down over the course of the week, down towards $2,160 per ton. Global copper inventories over the course of the month did go up from 1.27 up to 1.32 million tons in storage. Copper prices continued to remain around the same area, rated around $2.60 per pound. Zinc inventories are still dropping from 58 down to 55,000 tons in storage. A far, far cry down from uh, their height of 1 million tons in storage several years back. The prices remained fluctuating in the range right above $2,500 per ton. 
and tin inventories took a decent drop from 6,600 tons in storage down to 6,175, while tin prices continue fluctuating all over the place between $16,000 and $17,000 per ton. And the rare earth metals. Dysprosium, critical component for electric motors, from regular electric motors to the all-important electric vehicle motors, as well as a critical component for wind turbines, dropped a little bit from 341 down to just under $338 per kilogram. Neodymium, used for the same things as dysprosium, dropped a little bit from 67 down to just under $66 per kilogram. Gallium, the critical functioning element for LEDs, decreased a tiny bit from 290 down to $285 per kilogram. Rhenium, the aviation metal, a critical alloying component for the various super alloys used to create aircraft engines, stayed the same at $1,653 per kilogram. Germanium, the metal that allows the internet to exist, as it's the doping material used to make fiber optic cables. In particular, it's what allows them to maintain their perfect internal reflection angles so that the light signals can be sent completely unaltered from one end to the other. Germanium dropped a little bit from 2012 down to $2,004 per kilogram. Hafnium, a critical dopant material used in the making of computer processors and RAM, dropped a little bit from $1,539 down to $1,535 per kilogram. Terbium, another rare earth critical for electric motors and wind turbines, However, also critical for solid state and flash memory, dropped a tiny bit after its increase from 664 down to $659 per kilogram. And indium, the critical material of indium tin oxide, which is the material for and what allows our modern screens to exist. Display screens, electronic screens, TV screens, your phone screen, literally everything. Indium decreased a little bit from 331 down to $324 per kilogram. These decreases in price are coming about from increased production, which in turn is coming about from China restarting operations at several of its rare earth mines. Previously, a couple months ago, China had shut down some of its mines for environmental safety inspection, but they've restarted the operations at those mines. And in a few other random things... Gadolinium dropped a little bit again from $23.09 down to $22.66 per kilogram. Gadolinium is the data recording metal. It's purely gadolinium used on CDs, Blu-ray discs, and all things of the sort. And it's a combination of that metal and dysprosium that is used for the magnetic nanograins of hard drive discs. Lithium is now back up over $10,000 per ton. It had been under $10,000 per ton for several months now, but it now has crossed back up over the line. All right, that's about it for this week. So thank you everybody for sticking around and listening. Please like the video if you enjoyed hearing everything. Also again, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And please donate anything if you can. I will carve your name into a giant chunk of coal come Christmas time. But anyways, regardless of what happens to me, God bless all of you, and I will see you all around next time.